Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rechtenwald. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is the Bible in a Year podcast. My name is Luke Shortridge, hanging out with Andy Rechtenwald. Andy, how you doing today? Doing great, as usual. How you doing? Doing well. Did your daughter sleep last night? You got a full full rest, she, ready to go? You know, a couple weeks ago, we did get her shots. She got her second round of shots. Oh, man. Yeah, but she's a trooper, man. She's she's really you good. You just at, made the podcast sad. I know. It was really sad. Kayla actually stayed this time. Last time, she ditched me and ran out of the room, and I had to hold her down. It was it was miserable, but she's a trooper. I know she's sick, but she's, she's not screaming a bunch. She's great. Glad to hear it. Yeah. So today, we are discussing 2 Samuel. Yep. And here is my opening question for you, Andy. What causes smart men to do dumb things? Um, Well, looking at history, money, power, and beautiful women. Sounds about right to me. Uh, We were trying to think of some high-profile affairs that have happened in the past few years, and uh, we came up with a a short list, Mm -hmm. but uh, there is definitely plenty of examples out there we could have drawn from. Mm -hmm. So... uh, I don't know. What do you think? When I say a, a high-profile affair, who do you think about? Uh, David Petraeus, for sure. Uh, that's pretty recent. He's a four-star general. Served in the Army for, what, 37 years? He was the head of the CIA, mm-hmm. and he started having an affair with his biographer. Yep. Uh, I, I found it interesting how he got caught. So head of the CIA. His emails or something like that, right? Right. Well, what, what would happen is um, his biographer and him, they had one email account, which they shared, mm-hmm. and they would save racy love letters to each other in the draft folder. Saving. So they would never send it, but they would save it in the draft folder and then read it and mm-hmm. delete it. Sure. And because, you know, work for the CIA, they, <laughs> thought, they thought someone had hacked his account. Yep. Uh, because, like... Doesn't seem like him. Right, doesn't yeah. seem like him, and then it all came unraveled but, from you know, there. That, I also think of Tiger Woods. Um, that was a big That was a big one, um, being the, the best at that time, the best golfer in the world, and then all of a sudden it just, his whole life blew up. Do you remember when all the text messages and the voicemails came out? So weird. So you have the greatest probable athlete, probably the greatest athlete mm-hmm. in uh, American history, Maybe. Possibly. Uh, Arguably. And he's leaving voicemails like, love you forever. Yeah. Smiles. <laughs> he he could have worked on his text message he game. He definitely could have. Um, then, you know, also big one. This is a, probably the biggest name, Bill Clinton. Um, of course. Had his famous affair go public in 1998. Andy, uh, what grade were you in in 1998? Grade? I know that I was eight years old. I don't know how the grade <laughs> So. Yeah. Third Straight grade. Enough, though, I do remember the whole the whole thing because we watched it on TV and um, very interesting time for me. I was in high school and it was very weird. Yeah, really weird. I mean, you learn stuff about the president of the United he, States. Yep. You just don't want to know. Exactly. He talked about, you know, how uh, when he was con- confronted with it, he talked about weird things like the definition of is, which is a really funny. You should look it up. What Bill Clinton's definition of his thing, but uh, it was also pretty creepy. Yeah. You know, Bill Clinton was forty nine. Monica Lewinsky was twenty two. Yep, not even up for debate. I, I don't. I don't think it's up for debate. Men in a position of power, they they don't have a great track record uh, when it comes to beautiful women. I would agree with that, and that really leads us into Second Samuel. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about King David, yeah. who is probably the greatest king in all of Israel's mm-hmm. history. This is the golden age of the nation of Israel, yeah. and David made a horrible mistake, yeah. and it really just started to spiral out of control from there. Sure. Um, I think what we should do before we get in, as we usually do, is go through a couple of the context things for the book. First is uh, purpose. You want to know why uh, the writer is writing the book. And it, the purpose of Second Samuel is it establishes David's dynasty as like the proper king um, of Israel, coming from Saul and all the mistakes that Saul made into David and how he was a better king, a better leader. Um, Psalm 89, 36 to 37 says that as long as you see the sun and the moon in the sky, David's dynasty of kings will continue. So Absolutely. Very important. Right, and that's going to be very important Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into the Gospels, you look at the lineage of Christ. All of that was established right here in 2 Samuel. The author for the book, though, is unknown. Don't know who it is, Mm -hmm. again, like 1 Samuel. Some people have said maybe it was Nathan the prophet's son, but we don't know. We don't really know for sure, and and who he's writing to, it's always something you want to look into. Um, And just like 1 Samuel, uh, the audience of this book is the people of Israel. 
Very good. Yeah. The date of the writing is 930 BC, mm -hmm. which was soon after David's reign. Yeah. So it's written down right after David is off the throne. Right after he's off the throne, and it's really awesome to look at uh, the setting, what was going on in history at that time. And, and this, the setting of this book is the land of Israel under David's rule. Um, chapters 1 through 5 take place in a place called uh, Hebron, where David ruled over the tribe of Judah. Then, Jerusalem, where David ruled for 33 years uh, in the last portions of the book. Yep, so this book is really all about David's kingship. Yep. I mean, it just kind of chronicles that from the start to the end. That's yep. that's what the book is. The key people, of course, uh, David would be, you know, yep. kind of the most important yep. main character of this. Sure. Then you have Abner, um, so, who was Saul's main general. He kind of fought with Saul's weaker heir, a weak heir, and then uh, switched allegiances to David, which is a really cool story as well. So then you also have Joab, who is David's nephew, and he's the commander of David's army. Uh, kind of had a checkered past yeah. a, a little bit, mm -hmm. and we see as things move forward that Joab didn't always act honorably, but he was a great military leader. Yeah, um, and speaking of checkered past, uh, history, whatever, you, we have Bathsheba, who is... Um, a hussy! <laughs> <laughs> she's the she's the beautiful woman that David did not stay away from. Um, but what's crazy about her, as we see when God uses unlikely people, she is um, the mother of Solomon, and then she's also the unlikely link to Jesus Christ. Yeah, I I regret my statement. I'd like to get that removed. Yeah, we should probably strike that from the record. So we also have Nathan, and he was a prophet of God. He was a trusted advisor to King David, and he carefully confronted yeah. David about his sin. He had to choose his words very carefully because if you take off the king, you can be killed. Yep. Uh, then after that, we have the, the son of King David. His name is Absalom. Uh, he was handsome and charismatic, um, but then there's this kind of, there's something that happens in the book where then we see um, David's family kind of starting to fall apart, and Absalom pretty much leads a re an insurrection against David. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of the problems that happen there really go back to David. Mm -hmm. It goes back to his sin. And you see kind of, you know, one of the main themes of the book uh, would be the consequences of sin. Yeah. That when we do things contrary to how God have, has laid out uh, our lives for us, there's very real consequences. And it doesn't just affect us, it affects the people around us. Yeah, another thing that we can see in, in the different themes in this book is uh, kingdom growth. So seeing what happens when you have a solid leader, though David made the, the mistakes we're going to be talking about, the kingdom of Israel exploded. We talked about it last um last podcast about how in three generations they became the world's superpower and that's just insane to me yeah it it is amazing and it did not happen without god's help right. god was at the helm the entire way mm -hmm. uh another theme that really stands out in second samuel is the idea of justice yeah so uh, david showed mercy uh, he was shown mercy, and he also showed mercy to others, uh, but he also had a strong sense of justice. So he has to deal with, what do I do with Saul's family who are left over this past rival? David has won, and he wants to show mercy to them, but also be fair at the same time. Sure. And those are tricky decisions that he has to solve. Yeah, and finally, as you already kind of mentioned, um, the consequences of sin, that's the big, that's the big, big player. Absolutely. Yep. yep. And um, I think that uh, next what we should do is kind of look at what the over, overview of the book is to kind of give um, listeners here a little bit of a, a big picture. So we have David on uh, the first portion reigning over Judah. Then in the next portion, he's going to reign over all of Israel. We're going to see David's struggles, which we already kind of mentioned, and with his family and with Bathsheba. And then finally, we're going to look at what David's final years as king looked like. All right, well, let's go ahead and yeah. get into the text. Every week, we want to give you guys an opportunity to dive into God's Word with us. Mm -hmm. So if you are driving, don't pull out your Bible. But uh, if you are listening on your own, you can feel free to pull out a Bible mm -hmm. or if you are listening uh, through uh, iTunes, if you want to switch over to a Bible app, yeah. that will work great as well. We're going to be reading from the NLT version if you want it to sound the same as we read. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you are listening alone, I would encourage you to get a journal. Start journaling some of the questions that we are going to ask. If you're listening with a friend or in a group, you can pause the podcast and take some time to discuss some of the questions that come up because we really want you to interact with God's Word and sure. we want you to Definitely. apply it to your life. Yeah. Cool, cool. Let's get started. Um, apparently, there is a there's a key word throughout this 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 book, and that is the word has said. But you know what that means, because I'm not really versed on this. What does it mean? <laughs> 
I thought you were in seminary. <laughs> we yeah. haven't gotten to that part. No, it, it's funny in seminary. So I took one class on Hebrew mm-hmm. and one class on Greek, yeah. which is just enough information to be dangerous and mess up words. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. Yeah. Uh, but but I did look up this word hased, and it means loving kindness or loyal love. And it mm-hmm. does come in over and over and over again in Second Samuel. God showed his loving kindness to David and also to the people of Israel. Yeah. So if you turn to Second Samuel chapter 7 verse 15 God said but my favor and the word favor there is has said will not be taken from David as I took it from Saul whom I removed from your sight Mm -hmm. this is a key very important verse because David who we found out is a man after God's own heart still made mistakes he still did things his own way sometimes but God showed David mercy and he showed David's children mercy that even though David would not live up to his end to the bargain. God still uh, would show him mercy and would continue to keep him in that role as king and then keep his children in the role as king all the way through Christ. Yeah, and that's the beautiful thing about, I I love the Old Testament because a lot of times we as Christians kind of dismiss it. We don't want to read it because it's, you know, quote, the angry God. But you get to see the gospel at work in the Old Testament when you see God's unmerited favor and grace towards a person who, you know, doesn't deserve it. And I think that a question we, we should definitely be thinking a lot about, and for you guys that are listening, is when was a time that God showed you his grace when you when you didn't deserve it particularly? Like, you didn't do anything to deserve it. You maybe have made a lot of mistakes, and God still showed you grace and showered blessings on you. Think about that. You know, I think about when I was 14, I had grown up in the church, but I had a lot of anger, uh, a lot of uh, questions, doubts, things I was struggling with. And I got invited by my youth leader to go to a conference uh, in Columbus, Ohio. I'll never forget this. It was the spring of 1997, and I heard things I had heard my whole life, but it was as if I was hearing them for the first time. Things like, God loved me, God cared about me, my life mattered, God had a plan for my life. These were things that I had heard over and over again since I was a child, but for some reason it clicked and I realized that God really cared about me, despite me, despite my anger, my shortcomings, my weaknesses, yep. that God still chose me to be his servant and to be his son. Yeah, that's great stuff. And um, I think that's a key thing that we can continue to focus on is the unmerited favor that God gives his people. Um, so in the early part of Second Samuel, we see that David is reigning over Judah. Then he also reigns over the northern kingdoms as well, winning the battle against Saul's heirs. He doesn't take revenge, though, against um, the the heirs. He actually keeps his promise to Jonathan, remember his friend from 1 Samuel, um, to be kind to Saul's family. It shows a lot about his character that when he got into a position of power, he could have used that to Mm -hmm. wipe out all the heirs because every heir potentially is another rival, right? Uh, But he doesn't. He keeps true to his promise to Saul and to Jonathan, and he shows them kindness maybe even when he didn't have to. Yeah, and you see that through 1 Samuel, too. Every time he had an opportunity to kill Saul, a guy who was trying to kill him, David, because he respected the kingship, decided not to. He's a a, a man of character. Man of honor. Yeah. Well, let's move into 2 Samuel 11. Okay. So we're going to skip ahead a few chapters. Uh, Things aren't going well here for our king, and uh, I'm going to read some of the highlights here. So uh, in verse 1, it says, In the spring of that year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Amorites. They destroyed the Amorite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So this is a problem. (laughs) This is when the kings normally go out to battle. Uh, As we mentioned previously, the kings would many many times personally lead the troops in the battle, but David doesn't. Mm -hmm. He stays behind and he's bored. He's got time on his hands. Yep, I've heard several times people say that, a, that the most dangerous a man could be is when he's bored. I believe it. We'll see that. So we'll skip ahead, and we find out that he, being David, noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. I, I kind of wonder how this went down. So you know, he's just hanging out and just happens to notice this right. woman who's bathing. I, I'm sure it was completely accidental. <laughs> Not really. Not really at all. She is Bathsheba, as he asked about her, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So he finds out, before he's even met her, she's married, she's not yours, back off. Right, and and the crazy thing is he sees her, and as the king, he knows, because he knows God's law, he shouldn't be looking at, he shouldn't be looking and lusting after her, but instead of turning away, he sends a guy to go find out about her, and then the guy tells her, hey, she's married, and the guy she's married to is somebody that's fighting in your army. Right. That's crazy. 
even more of a betrayal. Yeah. So it doesn't stop David. He's the king. He can do whatever he wants. Yep. He does. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a message saying, I'm pregnant. Mm-hmm. So at this point, David confesses. He realizes how wrong he's been. No, not really. <laughs> That's not what he does at all. Not at all. He uh, gets Uriah back from battle mm-hmm. and gets him drunk, tells him, go home, relax, enjoy, uh, yeah. you know, be with your wife, and Uriah doesn't bite. Oh, man. I mean, the, you see, again, the char- when, I love when the Bible does this, when you see um, a contrast of character between two individuals. You have David, who's supposed to be the, the guy after uh, God's own heart, getting a guy drunk and trying to get him to go sleep with his wife to, to match up a timetable for a pregnancy he caused. Right. And Uriah going, I'm not going to do that because I'm a man of honor. In it's fact, he insane. says, how could I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? Mm-hmm. I swear I would never do such a thing Ugh. because he felt such a sense of honor to his fellow soldiers who right. were still in battle. And it wouldn't have been a sin for him to do it. I mean, that's the crazy thing. Sure. So David has got a problem. Mm-hmm. Now he has a woman who is pregnant. Clearly, she did not have relations with her husband. Right. Uh, what is he going to do about it? He decides to cover it up. Mm-hmm. And he tells the men in his army, what I want you to do is send Uriah to the front of the battle where the fighting is the strongest. Yep. Pull back. So basically Uriah will have no shot of mm-hmm. surviving it. And that's what happens. David gets word that Uriah has been killed. Mm-hmm. And he responds by telling uh his army uh, telling the messenger who's going to bring this back to Joab well tell Joab not to be discouraged David said the sword devours this one today and that one tomorrow fight harder next time Uh. and conquer the city (laughs) everything's great he's probably feeling relieved yep I mean that's the crazy thing when you read this he gives the letter of intent to murder uh, to murder Uriah to Uriah to give to his commander so you're just I'm reading this going like this dude like evil that is just sick it's borderline psychotic and then he comes back the guy's going to be afraid because the military the, the way that they went about fighting was totally out of character and not a good strategy and he's like well when he's when the king gets mad just say hey get by the way um uriah died and then david's like well it'll be okay we're all good have you ever heard the term or the phrase absolute power corrupts absolutely Mm-mm, no interesting though <laughs> Tell me more about it. I really it. expected you to say <laughs> yes to that. So David has absolute power. He's the king. He can do whatever he wants. And yeah. what starts out is a very innocent, got a little extra time on my hands, turns yeah. all the way into full-blown murder. Uh, Andy, have you ever had a sin spiral out of control? Don't get too personal here. You know, this is a family show. <laughs> but uh, what happened as a result of your sin spiraling out of control? I think it'd be hard for anybody to read the story and not relate to David, even something as simple as a small, like a little white lie, when you when you say something that's not true to somebody, and then they call you out on it, and and or you feel like you could get caught in it. So instead of just saying, "Oh, you know what, I lied," you you then start to lie more and more oh, yeah. and more and more and more. We we do exactly today what David oh, did yeah, for sure because we want to cover our tracks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got a quick story. So I was in kindergarten. My my bike. It, it just wasn't great. I still had training wheels on. Um, you know, it, it, it did okay, but it just was not good. Uh, I had a best friend who lived down the street. He had a red, huffy, five-speed bike. I love this story. And I wanted it. I, I loved his bike. <laughs> so I would ask him to come over and play, oftentimes just so I could just ride his bike. bike. Yeah. And, uh, we, you know, we came over. He parked his bike on the side of the house, and... Uh, We were playing video games, and I said, hey, my mom just called me. He's like, I didn't hear anything. I said, no, no, she just called me, so uh, you stay here. You play video games. I got to go take care of something. So I went. I took his bike. I parked it behind my house, like in between these bushes, so I hit it. So we get done done playing video games. He comes out. He's going to ride home. Oh, Lenny, your bike's gone. (laughs) Oh, sorry, man. Yeah, they're bike thieves, you know. They're terrible around here. Sorry about that. So he's upset. He goes home, and I had the best afternoon. I'm riding his bike up and down the street. I mean, I avoided his house, but I went everywhere with this thing. I'm going up and down the ditch, you know. I'm Uh acting like I'm a BMXer. And then it gets to be about 8 o'clock at night, and I realize I got a problem. Because I have a red huffy bike that clearly I didn't buy. My parents are going to ask me about this thing. If somebody in the neighborhood saw me having fun with this and word gets back to him, I'm in big trouble. Mm-hmm. So here's what I did. I took the bike back to his house and I just left it on his front doorstep 
and I told him nothing. <laughs> so when he woke up in the morning and went outside his bike, it just magically the reappeared. It. Oh my yeah, gosh. and I denied everything. That's amazing. I was does not he, a very good friend. Does he know today? Yeah, if he's a podcast listener, he does. <laughs> All right, um, back so, to our text. Where yeah, are we at? Yeah, we got to get back to the text. So uh, now we're going to pick it up in Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through 25. We're going to read a couple of these verses. So, um, Nathaniel, his friend, or Nathan comes to talk to David. Nathan's a prophet, a friend of David. Um, obviously God had given word to Nathan that what David had done. So God sends Nathan to kind of go confront, as you mentioned before, um, carefully confront the king. And, uh, yep. Luke, you want to pick it up in verse five? Yep. So David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. Uh, I should mention that Nathan kind of crafted a story Mm -hmm. of a man that had one little lamb, and a rich man came by, stole that lamb, and prepared it for dinner. David's furious. So he says, that that man deserves to die. Who would do such a thing? He must repay four lambs to the poor man that stole the one for having no pity. Mm -hmm. And then Nathan said to David, you are that man. I have to imagine that you could hear a pin drop when Nathan yeah. said that, and David realized that I've abused my power. Mm-hmm. I've become exactly what I didn't want to become. And I've been found out. And I've been found out, yeah. yep, that someone knows exactly what has happened. And to David's credit, uh, after that, he he really does come clean, mm-hmm. and it really looks like that he is upfront and honest about all that he did. Yeah. And because of that uh, I, honesty and that confession, mm-hmm. God forgives him, God shows him grace, and God loves David despite himself. Yeah, and I think that if we compare that to the way Saul reacted when he was confronted by Samuel because he was sacrificing back in 1 Samuel, instead of Saul admitting he did something wrong, he made excuses and gave the reasons for why he did what he did. David just says, I have sinned against the Lord. I confess I did I did sin. And that's that's the interesting, um, the difference between the two, the two men. It shows David's character. David is one of my favorite characters in the entire Bible. Mm-hmm. Not because he was perfect, but because he was imperfect. Um, But despite his imperfections, he still had a heart for God. He owned up and confessed to what it is he did. And because of that, God completely restored him and forgave him. So question, are all sins equal to God? Hmm. Maybe you've heard that before. So what, what I mean here is, is it the same if you kill someone or tell someone a white lie in God's eyes? Yeah, I think um, all sin separates you from God. Uh, Because we are sinners, we separate ourselves from God. But there are different consequences for our sins. I think we see that in this story. Um, Paul writes in the New Testament, we should flee from sexual sin because it's it's the one sin that you sin against your own body. So I don't think that there's um, a difference in the way that God... Uh, reacts eternally to sin because sin separates you from God. But your consequences on this earth, um, they're definitely different depending on the sin. So David confesses, verse 13. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I mean, he just flat out says it. Yep. I've sinned against the Lord. Uh, after this, uh, the so there's a child that's going to be born. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is still judgment, even though God forgives David. Yep. There are still consequences for his sin. And God tells David the child is going to die. Mm-hmm. David really goes into mourning. Yeah. Um, he went without food. He lays on the bare ground all night long. He's inconsolable. He's weeping before the Lord. Yep. And as God predicted, the child dies. There, there's a really interesting part, though, because right after the child is dead, yeah. David's demeanor changes. Uh, It says that David got up from the ground, he washed himself, he put on lotions, he changed his clothes. He went to the tabernacle and worshiped the Lord. After that, he returned to the palace and he was served food and he ate. So Andy, what do you think that's all about? I mean, why this quick change of heart? It is crazy. He he literally goes from seeming like he's depressed. I mean, he's just miserable. And if you imagine a a grown man, like a big, at this time, David's the military commander of the strongest nation, like, and he's on the floor sobbing. Right. And then he goes from that, they say, your child is dead, to, okay, let's get up, get clean, put lotion on. I think that what we can see why this happens, um, and David actually explains it because his people, his advisors say, well, what, what just happened? You went from this where we couldn't even talk to you. We tell you that your son actually dies, and now your demeanor entirely shifts. And he says in uh, verse 23, but why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Yeah, and I think that I will go to him one day part is key. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I think David's faith was renewed in yeah. God, and he knew that physical death was not the end, that yeah. he would see that child again. I think he felt incredible guilt for the mistakes that he made, um, but I think he also really experienced God's grace and forgiveness. Yeah. And because of that, he he was able to mentally shift and not let his past mistakes crush him twice. Mm-hmm. I think that, and I haven't experienced this yet as a dad, but for those of us that are parents, when you discipline your kid, you don't want them to live in fear of you after the discipline. Whatever the discipline is, is over. It's supposed to be something that corrects behavior. Um, but if you if you discipline your kid and they live in this shameful um, existence for the rest of their lives, that's not what you were intending. And God disciplined David by taking away his child. And David moves on afterwards, after the discipline happens, because, as you said, he has God's grace. And he has the freedom to move on. I think that's huge. Interesting you, you talk about discipline because that is one of the blind spots in David's character, that mm-hmm. God did discipline David, but David was unwilling to discipline his sons. Yeah. And as you read throughout the rest of the, the book, and we don't have time to get into it, uh, as you read more about David's sons and the problems that they have, it's almost like the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> yeah, and it all comes sure. down to David not disciplining his sons. Yep. I think he felt incredible guilt mm-hmm. still. Um, you know, he he had screwed up. And there were consequences for that. I think he probably struggled to hold his sons to a high standard sure. because he knew that he was imperfect himself. And again, there's very real consequences very for that, real. including an insurrection. By his own son. By his own son. Um, Absalom. And so we're going to be in Second Samuel chapter 18, picking it up in verse 9. Before this, um, Absalom has tried to lead an insurrection, and now he's being pursued um, by some of David's men. And here's what it says, verse 9. During the battle, Absalom happened to come upon some of David's men. He tried to escape on his mule, but as he rode beneath the thick branches of a great tree, his hair got caught in the tree. His mule kept going and left him dangling in the air. So this leads to Absalom's death. Joab kills Absalom, David's son. And as you can probably imagine, David was crushed. Mm -hmm. Uh, The rebellion was put down, but it was at the expense of his very charismatic, uh, incredibly looking, yeah. huge, wild hair yep. son. And David begins weeping loudly in front of his troops yeah. to the point where his troops uh, are kind of like, okay, why are we fighting for this guy? Right. If he's that upset that we've won this great victory, why are we even doing this? Yeah, in verse 33, it talks about uh, David's emotion. It says he was the king was overcome with emotion. He went up into the room over the gateway and burst into tears And he cried, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And just as you had mentioned, if I was fighting for David and when we killed his opponent, even though it was his son, and he starts freaking out saying, I wish I would have died. How does that question not come? How do you not say, what are we doing here? Why are we doing this? It's a tangled mess. Yeah. Um, So here's my question. When have you seen the sin of one person affect an entire group of people? Hmm. And then, frankly, why does God hate our sin so much? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it'd be it would be good for all of us to think about um, the effects that even our small sins have, uh, what they can do to the people around us. Yeah, and we we often think about sin as breaking a rule. Mm-hmm. You think, oh shucks, I broke a rule. Right. But the reality is our sin is betraying our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And there are consequences, uh, I would say, both physical here and now on this earth. And there's also spiritual consequences. Sure. Sure. I think that um, for you guys that are listening, uh, we would both encourage you guys to read 2 Samuel on your own. Again, we don't have the time to cram in all the stories. There's a lot of good stuff that we couldn't cover. And um, reading the story of the insurrection and everything, it's it's a great read. What are our next steps? What should we do next? Well... You know, we've talked a lot about sin. We've also talked about confession. Um, if God has revealed something to you as you've been listening to this podcast, something you're struggling with, something you're dealing with, mm-hmm. I would encourage you to first off, take it to God, and then also take it to somebody who you trust, because there is real power in confession. Mm-hmm. James 5.16 says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So confess your sins to God and to each other. It, it's truly never too late to repent of something that you are struggling with. Yep. Sure. Um, next next reading, we're going to be talking about uh, First and Second Kings. Get into the kingship. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about David's son, Solomon, uh, the divided kingdoms, and also the southern kingdom. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have 47 chapters to cover, Andy, <laughs> in the next show. Do you think we can do it? Uh, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. 
All right. Well, thanks for listening. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Until next time.